Okay, so Evan, I mean, App Inventor really is our, our project to democratize mobile technology. And it's a vision that anybody, you know, even kids or anybody who has no technical training can really start using this technology to be empowered in what's become a world that is now full of generative AI and full of all sorts of devices. And we've now been working on it since, what, 2010? Just about, yeah. Right? And then before that, it, went, it had about six years of development at Google that started right after 2006, right after the iPhone came out. And then Google moved it to MIT, and we've been expanding it and modifying it since then. And now we have, what, how many, how many users we have? Actually, just last week, we had 20 million users of AI2, which is our flagship. That, I think, is probably MIT's largest impact, certainly educational technology, right? And we've got a small team that's doing it. I mean, for me, what happens with App Inventor, there was an original vision when mobile phones came out. And people said, wow, that's really, really interesting and it's really a thing. And now we're, we're sort of in a new place. We're in a new place having to do with generative AI. And it's, it's as if uh, there was an expansion of possibilities. But over the last year, that thing is, has just become incredibly larger in terms of what people can imagine. I mean, what, what, do you, what do you think about some of the stuff that we're doing? Well, right. So we have a lot of new features, of course, that we're adding to App Inventor. And we're seeing that the generative AI craze that's happening uh, in the last year or so has really taken off and resonated with App Inventor users. You know, we have two new components, the chatbot and the image bot, that allow people to use generative AI as part of their applications to make question answering apps, to make art apps, uh, to really kind of take advantage of these new tools in a way that they may not be able to normally because the technology is just too inaccessible. It's now become, you know, throughout the whole country, throughout the world, this idea of generative AI and what's called, being called the no code movement. And pretty much everybody is thinking about that and commercial implications. They're saying, who do we have to hire? Do they really need to know programming? Do they need to know computing? And it's like the whole world has expanded. But what we're doing now is we're thinking about that with respect to kids. So all of these ideas of expansion and access also correspond to kids. And I think for us, who've been thinking about education for so long, there's the question of what, well, what is it do we want to be teaching in computer science? You know, what, what is it we want to teach in terms of programming when these generative AI programs can can write the programs themselves. And so I think the challenge for us, not only at MIT, but throughout the education world, is what does it now mean to teach people about computing when there are just so many possibilities and so many options? Do you have, do you have any favorite examples of, of that? Uh, well, certainly, you know, I like to kind of compare it to the evolution of programming technologies kind of since the 50s, right? When you look at both the evolution of programming languages and the evolution of how you program, um, you know, we've seen a lot of that in terms of you used to punch punch cards and then you had to write assembly and then you had to write C. And yet the, the technology trends towards making things easier and more accessible to folks. And with kids in particular and children, we're looking at you know, these are not really difficult concepts necessarily. They just might have been presented in a difficult way. And when you put a technology like App Inventor in front of them, they can do some really amazing things because you kind of remove that kind of expectation of complexity that one might have. Like we talk about coding, like, oh, coding's really hard. Well, it's not really hard. You just need to think in the right way to be able to access what the computer can do and App Inventor is one way of making it easier for, for children to understand and be able to leverage it. Yeah, and now the next thing you mentioned, Alexa. You know, so that's sort of the next uh, advanced piece of tech that we're doing. And the idea of Alexa is you can just speak a description of an app and the computer will create the app. You can say, uh, you know, build me an app with a button that has the name of a language on it. And when I press the button, translate what I say into that language. So you literally say that to, to the system, and then the system produces an app that does that. 
Right, yeah. So we've been working to combine App Inventor's block-based coding language with generative AI tools like OpenAI's GPT models so that, yes, you can, in fact, be able to describe simple applications with uh, you know, natural language and App Inventor is able to create those apps for you. And actually, one of the really neat things I've seen with this technology is uh, we showed it to some of our power users who are based in the Netherlands, and they gave us app descriptions in Dutch, and the system was still able to make the app for them. And of course, I, as an English speaker, uh, can look at that app and be able to use it uh, because it's a visual programming language. And then with App Inventor, because we offer the language uh, App Inventor language in 14 different native languages, you know, I could look at the blocks in Chinese, I could look at the blocks in Spanish, and I can understand what the program is doing without necessarily having to understood the original description that the user provided. So it's a great way of collaborating internationally with people around building applications. And the wild thing is that the thing that's, that's going from spoken language to building the app can do it in Dutch, even though when we built it, it was in English. Exactly. So the, it, it's just an example of how everyone, you know, even the most advanced developers here at MIT, are constantly surprised by the power of these things. And now you say, what does it mean that you take that power and you make it available to kids and to, and to everyone? So right now everybody's focused on, oh, you can write code. But we're going to the next step. We're going, it's not only you write code, the code's not there. You just describe what you want and it builds the app. Right, so we've got that running with Apple now in, in prototype, but, but gosh, you know, who knows what's going to be next? It's really a little bit mind-boggling. Right, and so one of the things we're looking at is how can you make the applications that Apple is generating more complex? Uh, certainly a lot of the early examples we've taught it with have been, uh, you know, fairly simple in their construction. They maybe correlate to, you know, five to ten blocks, which in App Inventor is actually a very powerful set of uh, constraints to, to work with. Um, and in those early demos, we showed that one of the really neat features of these large language models is their ability to stitch together concepts from different programs in order to make more complex applications. And now we're trying to see if we can take that to the next level by adding editing capability into Aptly. So you might get an app. It may not do exactly what you intended for it to do based on your description, but now you can start to have a conversation with the computer and say, you know, hey, could you move that button over to the right? Or could you make it bigger? Or could you change the color? Or, you know, the behavior is not correct. Could you change the code to do X, Y, and Z? And it can go ahead and actually start to make those edits on your behalf. So even if you aren't quite sure where uh, you can grab that functionality in the code, uh, the system knows and it can kind of figure that out for you based on the instructions you're giving it, which leads you to really being able to build more and more complex applications um, than the original system was able to generate, which is really fantastic. And so the, I mean, the, the mind-boggling thing is this stuff keeps getting more and more powerful. And of course, our particular spin at, in the MIT App Inventor project is can we make that power available to kids? Yes. Not just professional programs, but really, can anyone do this? And I want to say the sky's the limit, but who knows if even the sky is the limit in this? Well, I hope so. I mean, we talk, we've definitely, in, in previous uh, collaborations, talked about sending stuff to the International Space Station, so we're hoping to go further than, <laughs> than the sky. Uh, but it is really fascinating to look at the impact that App Inventor has had uh, over the last 15 years or so, where we've had kids building apps from Eastern Europe to the Indian subcontinent. We've had people building apps to uh, help veterans uh, after they leave the service, uh, to folks who are building an app for an individual person who has trouble speaking and just can't communicate. And so the per you know we had someone who made an app, a uh, retired programmer actually, so they could have built it in Android Studio or in Xcode, which are the Google and Apple products for building applications. But they decided App Inventor is such an easy way for me to quickly put together an app to help somebody that that was their ultimate decision was, I'll just build it in App Inventor. It's so much easier. I mean, what you're hinting at is it's changing not only for us in education, but it's changing everybody's idea of what programming should mean. Again, you just kind of say what you want, and then it gets built. And that sounds like, that, that sounds like science fiction or hand-waving but it's really, really starting to happen. 
I think it's also a bit of a matter of perspective, right? When we talk about programming and coding, people often go to this vision of programming and coding is about the computer. But it, programming and coding are not about computers, they're about humans. It's about what are the problems do I see in the world and how can I leverage a computer to solve it? But ultimately, you know, if it isn't a human impact, uh, then you're not really going to be coding. Everyone's motivated to code because they want to solve a problem. And just think about that all being made possible. So one of the really amazing things about App Inventor and its relationship with CSAIL, of course, is that at CSAIL, we have amazing researchers building amazing technologies, but those technologies are really at the forefront of innovation. And App Inventor is able to take those technologies and represent them in a way that makes them accessible to the whole world so that anyone in the world can make an app that does something interesting, solves a problem they may see in their community, and ultimately lift this all up. And I think the thing to understand, first of all, in terms of advice for teachers, it's not merely that kids can make this stuff, it's that the stuff that kids can make can now have a real impact. Any 14-year-old uh, can put up a database that's accessible to anybody in the whole world because of internet technology. And so one of the things that I hope App Inventor is getting across, it's not only that kids can do it, but kids can do serious things that have real impact. And part of that is the way we've designed the system, but part of that is we've been able to rely on technology from CSAIL. I, you know, we said at the beginning that we have 20 million users. I think it's a million users a month. That's not an obvious thing to be able to put up. And so we're in the wonderful position of being in a place that really thinks about education and about even theoretical computer science, but at the same time has the actual technology to make this available. And that's, that's really what we're working at. And I think teachers need to understand that. So it's not merely that kids can do kind of interesting things for them. It's that if, if kids have good enough ideas, they can do something that can impact their city or their country or anything. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, children being able to make real positive impact in their communities. It reminds me of a story of Gitanjali Rao, who uh, as a 13-year-old heard about the Flint, uh, Michigan water crisis with lead poisoning that was basically affecting the people because of lead in the water. And so she made a device that could detect the uh, levels of lead and built an App Inventor app around it to be able to read the data off and visualize it so people could really see what was going on. Uh, and now, uh, full circle, she's a student at MIT. The interesting thing about her project is the thing that impressed people when she originally did it. Not so much that she had the sensors and did this stuff, but she's actually able to make an app that let people use it. Mm -hmm. So that's become a little bit uh, not, not so novel right now, five years later. But it really is that people can use this app technology to expand what they're doing, both in terms of the the applications they're allowed to do, but in terms of who they're allowed to make it accessible to. And that's really part of App Inventor's vision.